meet later. I'm pleased to welcome you to this important training on using boundaries to improve the health of family relationships. Today, you get to the chance to hear directly from one of the leaders in the field, Nedra Glover Tawab. She believes that poor boundaries underlie most relationship issues, and she'll teach you how to help your clients set and maintain effective boundaries. You'll also get to listen in as Nedra talks with three amazing experts. Carl Pillemer, who has studied challenging relationships for decades and knows all about what science tells us can create harmony. Joshua Coleman, whose expertise in family estrangements is paving the way for therapists to be more helpful. And Lindsay Gibson, whose work identifying characteristics of emotionally immature parents and how to deal with related dynamics has changed the way therapists practice. Some quick details to keep in mind, if you'd like to ask questions today, you can go to pessy.com forward slash ask Nedra and submit your questions via the online form. There'll be many questions coming in today. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Note that tech or event related questions can't be answered through that form. For that kind of assistance, please visit the FAQ page in your event portal. If you're earning CE with us today, complete details about how to claim your certificate can be found online in your portal. And to redeem your free copy of Nedra's book, Drama Free, check the email you'll receive with instructions. If you haven't upgraded to one of the CE plus book packages yet, there's still time to do so. Details are in your portal. And be sure to visit the online store in your portal for exclusive discounts on trainings and books related to today's event. And now, without further ado, I'm happy to welcome the wonderful Nedra Glover to Wab. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to do this training. Um, if you have questions, as Victoria mentioned, because of the amount of people here, we have set aside some time to have Q&A, um, but also, you know, there may be some points during our discussion where I may say, okay, who has questions? Um, and that will be another opportunity to get through some of your questions. I want us to have a colorful discussion today. There will be moments where I'm just talking, 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 and there will be other moments where I ask you to reflect on some of the information that is shared. So let's get started. All right. Please confirm that um, my slides are showing properly. I hate to be uh, showing what I was last Googling this whole thing, so. Yes, we can see your slides. Wonderful. I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope they don't see my shopping carts. Um, okay. All right. So first, I'd love for us to start with getting an idea of what a dysfunctional family is. Often, um, when people come into therapy, they have tons of family issues, and sometimes they don't even know that those interactions are unhealthy. So what is dysfunction? Dysfunction is any sort of pattern that is persistent and unhealthy for a person. So dysfunction could be alcoholism. It could also be gaslighting. It could also be issues with siblings, mother-in-laws, um, overbearing parents. It can be an assortment of things. I didn't want to keep dysfunction or unhealthy to what we typically think of, which is, you know, enmeshment, codependency, substance abuse, abuse and neglect. I want it to broaden the scope of that because all of those things do become clinical issues. So the top three things that we typically see in therapy for dysfunction is addiction, neglect, and abuse. 
Addiction can be alcohol, it can be drugs, it can be gambling. Also, you may see some shopping things. Now, I know clinically some of us are on the fence about is shopping an addiction, is social media an addiction, is, um, you know, there's another one, sex. Can those things be an addiction? And I would say when they are getting in the way of relationships, if you don't, if you're not treating it as an addiction, it is certainly a dysfunctional pattern. Neglect. Often our clients may not notice when they're being neglected because neglect is very unintentional and people can easily make excuses for being neglected because their parent didn't need to do it. They had to, you know, in many cases, take on responsibilities because it was they were raised by a single parent or for all of these really big reasons, but the neglect still has an impact on their life in some way. And abuse, you know, that is more blatant. It is physical, it can be sexual, and it can be verbal. What we typically deal with the most in therapy is verbal abuse in the adult relationships where the parents are saying things that are very harmful. I have, you know, worked with some folks who have been hit by their parents, even as adults. Um, and certainly there's a lot of childhood stuff that may have happened, but typically in adult relationships, we are seeing more verbal abuse than anything. So addiction, neglect, and abuse are the big three that we typically see in families. I would love to know, you know, if you could just take a minute and think about it, how does addiction abuse or neglect show up in your population? Is it something that your clients easily recognize? Is it something that um, you have to highlight? Is it something they come into awareness around after seeing you for a while? I wonder how that shows up. Recently, I've had a client who um, I've been seeing her for years. And she's always been having these issues in a family relationship. And just recently, she disclosed that her family member is an alcoholic. And when she told me about it, she said, oh my gosh, I can't believe I didn't tell you. And I said, well, I believe you didn't tell me because you weren't ready for me to know. So I wonder why you're sharing now. And the now was she's now ready to deal with what that means for her. And maybe four years ago, three years ago, she wasn't ready yet. So one of the things that happened with a lot of these family issues, we don't know the whole story. We only know what the person is sharing. And sometimes they share it when they're actually ready to address it and they'll keep it to themselves as long as they need to, to be able to come in and you know talk about things without actually getting to the root of the problem. Now, when this happens, you know, pers we, we can, you know, we're human and we may personalize it. We may say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been seeing this person for five years and they never told me this about their husband or this about their mother. This was the really big thing. And we have to be very careful not to personalize that and recognize that they're not sharing yet because they're not ready. And so when those things come up, it's, it's wonderful when they do. And we also have to manage our feelings around them withholding because they withheld for a reason. So if your client grew up in a dysfunctional family, they probably thought it was normal too. So this is a listicle that I created on Instagram and it made its way to drama free. So I want to go through each of these and talk a little bit about, about why these things are an issue. Um, forgive and forget with no change in behavior. Clinically, this shows up as resentment. It shows up as animosity and it shows up as shame because they have not moved on yet. Um, I'll have a lot of clients sometimes who have these relationships with certain family members where the expectation is get over it. And so they really try. They try to get over it. But unfortunately, it's, it's big enough to them that they really can't move past it. 
And so they're trying to continue in the relationship, but the backdrop of everything is all the bad stuff that happened. Um, the moving on. Uh, sorry to interrupt, this is Maddie. Um, we're still just seeing your first slide. Is that the slide we're supposed to be on? No. Nothing has moved. Yep, no, nothing has moved. Can you try hitting um, new share at the top of your screen? Yes, how about and now? Then choosing, there we go. Perfect. Okay. And for everyone out there, the slides are available under your um, PESI portal. So you can always See, go and check it. moving now? Yes, they're moving now. Okay, I'm just moving it along. Okay, all right. Um, so forgive and forget was the first one. Moving on as if nothing happened. Um, so we'll have clients who will share this really big news with us and they'll just try to like skirt over it. They're like, yeah, and at the family gathering, this happened. And then on Tuesday, you know, they're telling us all this information, but they're not really giving themselves the opportunity to process it or even have a feeling about it. Um, they cover up problems for others. So, you know, when they're not mentioning that stuff, that is a part of them being in that dysfunctional relationship, not even telling the therapist, maybe not even telling other people in their life, many of the things that are happening. They deny that a problem exists. Um, I've had clients mask um, alcoholism or abuse with words such as they drink a lot or they um, that's just how they talk to everyone they start to normalize some of these really dysfunctional tendencies in other people they keep secrets that need to be shared now there are some secrets that you know you may not want to tell you may not want to tell everything but there are some things that are really impactful to us and sometimes really harmful that we have learned we can't share with others. Um, thankfully, our brains will sometimes block these things out. So we have no way of understanding what some of those things are. So through the therapy process, clients will have these uncoverings of things that happened, you know, 20 years ago or things that happened, you know, that they kind of didn't address and now it's coming back up. So things will come up and sometimes it's a secret. Sometimes it is just a repressed memory. Many of our clients will pretend like they are fine with the dysfunction. I see this a lot in, in folks who were neglected because the abuse is often unintentional. There is a lot of empathy for the, uh, for the person who neglected them. There's a lot of empathy for the situation and not a lack of and not a lot of caring for self, not a lot of self-awareness of how the person was impacted by the things that happened. I wanna break down really quickly, just like what neglect can look like. It can be physical and that can look like, you know, maybe someone not having um, winter clothing if they lived in a colder cli climate. It may be, um, them not having utilities in their home. It may be things that surround their physical safety that a parent just did not do. Um, it can also be emotional when a kid has an issue or when they have some, some feeling that they want to express, they're not able to express it to family. Um, they're not able to talk through certain things. So those are the two ways that we typically see neglect. Um, not express their emotions. So when people grow up in dis dif dysfunctional families, there is a tendency to not be able to express things. And because I work with children early on, I use a lot of those tools, you know, feeling cards. I don't know if we're still playing the ungame with clients, but just different things to get them to identify their feelings. So a lot of how did this feel? How did that feel? When they said this to you, how did you feel about that? Or if it's a past thing, you know, I wonder what you felt when you were nine and this thing happened. So even taking them back because they have bypassed the necessity to even feel, to be able to survive these conditions sometimes. Um, they will continue to be around the very people who harm them. So a lot of this harm is not in the past, 
it is still in the present. Sometimes it is people who are continuing to do the same things, or maybe they've transitioned away from it, but they're still in those situations where they are being harmed by people. Um, unfortunately, sometimes when people have, you know, they grew up in a dysfunctional family, you will see them using aggression to get what they want because they are trying to survive. They're constantly in that survival mode. So you may see that sometimes with your clients. So other factors that contribute to childhood dysfunction, self-absorbed parents emotionally immature parents and just a you know we'll go into detail a bit uh, on emotionally immature and self-absorbed parents later with Lindsay domineering parents enmeshed family relationships competitive relationships within the family and children parenting their parents Exploring protective factors. So when someone is from a dysfunctional family, it is also often the case that they may feel a bit disempowered. And so much of our work around helping them through the process is to help them highlight you know, the things that have been positive for them, also to explore some protective factors that they may have experienced. Um, strong connections with safe adults, positive parenting influences that can be a friend's parents it could be the the people down the street it can be you know maybe a teacher just some sort of safe adult a uh, strong values or a sense of purpose for some of us that is innate we just feel it we feel like i will not be this thing i will rise above this circumstance this will not be my life forever they may experience the ability i mean they may um be protected by the ability to self-regulate and have a positive outlook and also be resourceful so those are things that again you know some of us just naturally have that and other times we just learn it you know family isn't the only teacher this is something that people may learn in school they may learn it from other relationships healthy social connections that can be any group that could be sporting it could be cheerleading gymnastics girl scouts boy scouts the boys and girls club it can be any sort of connection that you may have to some sort of social support system also support from peers and mentors there are so many options where people may be able to um you know get support from their friends and talk to their friends about some of these things that they may be experiencing. Um, and lastly, continual structure, structured programs that increase exposure to healthy relationships. That could be the YMCA, it could be you know, a program at your school, any of those sort of things. You know, I think one thing for clients who may come from lower socioeconomic backgrounds that there are a lot of programs that exist within school systems to help them um, be more stable or to help them with that structured programming piece. So a lot of the programming is gonna be in the school system and not necessarily in the community, but for other people, um, maybe middle-class, higher-class, those may be community supports. I would love to take a few questions because I feel like that was just so much information shared. So Victoria, if you have any, let me know. If not, I'll move on. Sure, yeah, there's a couple questions, Nandra, thank you. Um, you. You said it's normal for clients in dysfunctional families to get good at being fine. Mm -hmm. is, is that a way to stay safe in the family system? And if so, how do we help our clients feel safe while acknowledging that the family system is dysfunctional. Mm. That is a way to survive the family system. Um, there is this wonderful show on HBO and the name of the show escapes me. If someone knows it, please let Victoria know. But a guy is accused of committing a crime and he's immediately imprisoned. 
And as soon as he gets to jail, he adapts. He starts getting tattoos. He starts becoming more violent. Now, this was not his way, but this is what he did to survive this environment. So sometimes um, those survival skills, they don't stop existing when people are no longer in those dysfunctional relationships. Yeah. So they may not be aware of the dysfunction because this is their norm. You know, there are a lot of our clients who are uncomfortable with healthy relationships. Um, I've had to talk people through like, girl, date him. He sounds amazing. And the person is doing things that are supportive. They are all green flags. They're calling. And it's like, oh, he calls so much. Well, you could date people who never call you and check on you. So sometimes having that perspective of this unhealthy thing is the norm is really unhealth, unhealthy for our clients. And we have to highlight, um, is the norm even healthy? Because what you experience, it can be normal for you, but it is also in general, unhealthy and dysfunctional for people. And you use skills that you needed for that environment. So that's a really positive thing for them. Wow, you were able to adapt, you were able to survive because of this, you know, this, this stature that you developed, this inability to feel with all of this conflict going around that kept you, you know, in that situation, it really got you through. But these may be skills that you need to release. These are skills that you no longer need in this new environment. So how do we help you adapt to a new set of circumstances? Mm -hmm. uh, Victoria, if you have one more, I can do one more question. Sure. Yeah. So like honor and acknowledge the survival and also be kind of a, a relationship consultant helping to educate them about um, the experience that they've had. Um, so you also mentioned that clients who grew up in dysfunctional families often have empathy for the person who neglected them versus caring for themselves. How do you help those clients shift their empathy to themselves? Mm -hmm. It's almost as if we are like teaching self-love in a way. Um, it's okay to be empathetic for others while being empathetic for yourself. It's okay to have an issue with how someone treated you while also um, holding them accountable for some of those actions. And when people are, in unhealthy relationships, all of the empathy goes towards the other person. And that's a part of the conditioning to keep them in those situations. They are almost um, indoctrinated to feel that level of empathy for a person who actually harmed them. So it's, it's not necessarily our job to point out who the bad guy is, but it is our job to say, you also are worthy of empathy. And that's why the tool of, you know, I, I guess now we call it reparenting, but the tool of taking them back to themselves and helping them figure out what they needed and what they need now, because many of our clients, they may not know, they may assume that, you know, this other person has a bigger need. When you're in a dysfunctional situation, let's say, you know, you're raised by a single parent and you see this parent, you know, working really hard and struggling and working two jobs, it, you, you know, the, our clients might feel pretty crappy saying, I would have loved for you to come to some games because they're like, well, they couldn't because they had this job. Mm -hmm. And both of those things can exist. You know, you could have really wanted them to come to your game or support your activities and recognize that, wow, they couldn't because they had this job. That does not mean that anyone's need or issue is bigger. It means that two needs existed and one was not met. Right. So helping them understand that there is room for all of the needs and you don't have to pick whose problem is bigger, who has the bigger thing can be really helpful for them to understand. Like I can be empathetic for myself. I can feel those things without feeling like this other person is terrible. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they're not feeling that stuff because they're like, oh my gosh, I don't want to say these terrible things about a person who I know worked really hard, who I know 
did all of these things for me and my siblings or whatever their story is, but it can still be neglect. Um, so helping them get out of the thinking of if I say a truth about someone, it doesn't mean that I don't love them or um, that I have to now be mad at them for this thing. I'm just acknowledging that a need was not met for me. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Am I on the next slide yet? Okay. Yes. Great. All right. So. Let's talk a little bit about environment or genetics, uh, where a person grew up, who they grew up with, and the things they experience in their home have lifelong impl implications for who they are. This would be a wonderful time for us to take a break. I mean, not a break, just take a moment and really think about this statement. When we think about our clients and what they're doing in adulthood, think about your I don't want to say your favorite client, but let's admit it, we all have one. Um, think about a client that you have and their family relationships. Who did they grow up around? What were some of the behaviors that you see them mimicking? How do you see this playing out in their life currently? Is it environmental or do you believe it to be some genetic factors there. I'm just gonna take a few minutes and let you think about that environment or genetics. So um, in depression is contagion, contagious. Um, one of the, the takeaways was children of depressed parents are three times more likely to develop depression themselves. Now I know most of us have been to trainings where it has been proven that it is biological. Uh, we've read many books where it talks about the biology of depression and bipolar disorder and schizophrenia and all of these things. In this book, Depression is Contagious, I found it really interesting that the author talked about the ways in which people learn from their environments, how you can learn depression from being around a depressed person. You learn to be anxious from being around anxious people. I think about, you know, some of the things that, that people say that are anxiety-based statements, right? So like, be safe. Oh my gosh, watch yourself. Like, are you being careful? Did, you know, like all of these things that we start to take on, like, is that biological or is that like environmental? We're around people saying certain things. You know, when you think about children who grow up in depressed homes, not only does the depression impact them perhaps biologically, but the parent is interacting with them less. The parent is talking to them less. The parent is more withdrawn. So those environmental factors are also curating some of their depression, some of their feelings of loneliness, not fitting in, not having anyone to talk to. So with our clients, it can be really important to think about, is it a biological issue or could this be a part of the environment in which they grew up in? One of the things that I think is really helpful is to pull them away from the talk of being powerless. And how do we do that? We notice the things that they can do. We notice the things that they've been able to do. So when they get into the conversations around, well, I can't because, um, I can't because I wasn't taught this. I can't because my mom depressed and now I'm depressed and then two of my siblings are depressed or whatever those things are, you know, how do we help them reshape that language? So now I would love for us to just think about teaching clients 
their strengths. You can go back to the client you thought about in the last example, or you can choose a new one, but I'd love for you to develop some strength-based language for some of the things that our clients are dealing with. I'll give you a few minutes. In my sessions with my clients, giving them strength-based language is the therapist being their biggest cheerleader, even when they can't. Because sometimes our clients can be so disempowered that they don't have the strength to even think about a strength. They think everything is a weakness. They think many things about them are a problem. And so how do we pull them towards well, you did this well, or you're wonderful at this. You know, clients are often shocked when we've been seeing them for several years. And we have something positive to say about them because they may ha not have anyone else in their life saying something positive or even reframing some of the things that they do. For example, um, you know, everybody just lets, you know, I just let everybody walk all over me. You have so much compassion for people and you're here to learn how to stand up for yourself, but you're such a compassionate person, you know, just giving them something positive, even when we're noticing some of these negative behaviors with them, because it can be so helpful for them to just have someone to say something wonderful and they, they can they can start to catch on and they may start to figure out, oh my gosh, like I am compassionate. And that's why I do this thing. Compassion is a beautiful thing, but we don't want people to abuse it. That's the space we want them to get to. So how do we take some of these things and turn them into a strength? I think of another one that I am the person in my family that everybody comes to with an issue. Wow you must be like a therapist, like you're doing the work for free. You must give really wonderful advice. I wonder what it would be like if you took some of that advice yourself or you took some time for yourself to process some of those things that you're processing with other people. So we can, you know, in a, in a beautiful way, really carefully reshape some of the things that they are doing that might be problematic in these family relationships. Creating a space to explore what really happened. So we, in this, in this part of, you know, dealing with dysfunctional families, we have to normalize the discomfort. It's really uncomfortable sometimes for people to talk about and address some of the things that are happening. We will get into guilt later. We'll get into, you know, shaming and all of that stuff. But a big part of our job is to normalize that it's not going to be easy to come to some of these truths around your experiences and even to set boundaries or address some of these things that the discomfort is normal, that the worry, the anxiety, the, you know, oh my gosh, what will they say? All of that stuff is normal when you haven't been doing something. It is what happens when we're doing something new. If we never exercise and then the next day we decide to, you know, do 50 sit-ups, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's something new. It's to be expected. Focus on their strengths. 
Um, we just explore, you know, just some different ways to reframe some of the problems they're having. So it's more of, you're so good at this and I wonder what, or, you know, I notice you do this thing because you're so compassionate, you know, really reshaping some of those things. And we really have to work with them on how honesty is not betrayal because so many of our clients feel absolutely terrible just for being honest, just for saying, you know, anything. Recently, I've been, you know, talking to people about what does love mean? I did an Instagram poll recently and I asked people, what was the last thing you lied to your parents about? And I promise you 60% of the answers was, I lied and said, I love you. Can you imagine that? That people are unclear around if they love their parents based on some of these dysfunctional things that, you know, they, they feel like, oh my gosh, I can't even tell anyone this. I can't even, you know, be honest in my relationship with my parents because I'm, you know, it's almost like a force to be able to say it instead of saying, you know, I need to work, we need to work on our relationship. These are the things that I'm, I'm troubled by, you know, the honesty is a really big thing in dysfunctional families. It does seem like you're doing a really terrible thing. Sometimes with siblings, you'll see this. Sometimes with extended family, you will see that this, that honesty is a really terrible thing. Okay. So some of the other issues that might require a therapist's attention, um, family members with untreated mental health issues, rivalry, one-sided relationships, and blended family issues. So often we will have folks come to therapy and they have not used the DSM, but they will say, you know, my mother is bipolar. My father is narcissistic. You know, narcissism is a really big one right now. My brother is depressed and they, these folks have not had a clinical evaluation. And in those situations, we may, you know, listen to the client, but also, you know, it's not necessarily our job to diagnose a person who we've never met. And then there are other times where family members very clearly have a diagnosis of something and um, it's not treated. The person isn't trying to necessarily improve the issue. And so, you know, it comes up because our clients are wanting to be in a relationship with this person who um, has this mental health issue that's untreated and it's really impacting the relationship. Rivalry, that can happen um, in any type of family relationship. It can be cousin to cousin, sibling to sibling, parent to child. Um, we have some sort of competition. We have something we're trying to prove to each other. We're trying to one up each other. We have some sort of thing that um, maybe is not spoken about, but it's certainly something that is causing continuous conflict. One sided relationships. We may see our clients doing all of the work to keep a relationship going, all of the calling, all of the initiating family gatherings, all of the things to keep a relationship going. Or we may see them not being supported sometimes with um, like events they may have, but they're always supporting other people. And blended family issues. Often when I see couples um, and there are children involved, there are challenges around how to parent the children, how to be an in-law relationship. So these are some other things that will come up as therapeutic issues. So here are some unique ways that childhood impact um, adulthood. One of the biggest things that you know we typically see is anxiety, a fear of people. Um, you know, that's fear of confronting people, worrying about their responses, sometimes avoiding people. We will see, we will see depression. It presents as being powerless in those family relationships to do anything about the family relationship. 
And we will see a lot of alexithymia, which I spoke about earlier, which is the inability to name and process emotions. Um, when people have this childhood dysfunctional stuff, we will see them unable to, I don't know how I feel, or they'll name, I'm angry, I'm sad. You know, it's, they really stay in that area, but the whole plethora of I am indifferent, I am nervous, I am confused, I am um, upset, I am, you know, all of those things they may not be, be able to express. So a part of our work with them is getting them to name what they feel in our sessions. And the way that us therapists love to do that is, how did that make you feel? Do you know how, how you felt when that happened? I wonder how you felt when that happened. Hmm, I'm noticing that that's making you feel a, a type of way. Can you name that? You know, so we, we try to pull that out of them so they're not um, re-experiencing some of this stuff. We want them to be able to talk about what they're actually experiencing. Um, depression, um, yep, that powerlessness and then anxiety. I wanna go back for just one second um, and talk a little bit more about the anxiety. The anxiety is typically where people stay with these family relationships. They get so um, bogged down in the what ifs. If I say this to this person, they will do this. And sometimes it's not unreasonable. It's not out of nowhere. It's like this person has done this thing before. When people talk to them, this is typically how they respond. They've seen it with other family members. And so they may say, hey, I don't want to, you know, confront so and so, or I don't want to have this difficult conversation. And that may be a space where we need to talk to them more about how to manage their behaviors in that relationship instead of what they're verbalizing in those relationships. We'll talk more about that as we get into the boundaries part of it, but just put a pen there that this may be a part where behaviorally they have that fear. Um, and, you know, verbally, they just won't do it. Childhood trauma impacts our ability to process and express emotions, and it increases the likelihood of maladaptive emotional regulation strategies. In particular, children exposed to violence have challenges in distinguishing threat and safety cues. I think this is really important because when people have those dysfunctional relationships, they can feel like, what is that? What is that book? Uh, is it Henny Penny where, you know, it's like the sky is falling? Everything could potentially be a tragedy. Um, and sometimes it is not. But because of the chaos experience, any threat like dysregulates them. Any type of you know, challenge can be very uncomfortable. So we have to be aware of how much we're pushing because that resistance can be really high based on the level of dysfunction they experience and also what was modeled for them as safety and what was not modeled for them. So what are some signs that your clients might need healthier boundaries in their family relationships? I think this is a wonderful space for us to pause and really think about that. What are some signs? Just think about a few of your clients. What are some signs that you're seeing that they may need some healthier boundaries in their family relationships? Are you seeing you know, this, this resistance to saying certain things? Are you seeing issues with siblings or blended families? What sort of things are you seeing? Victoria, I'd love to pause and maybe take a question. Sure, let me pick one. There are so many questions coming in. Nedra. Let's take a few. <laughs> I um, hate pull up, so. Yeah. So it might not be specific to what you're talking about right now. I'm going to just pull a few that have come in throughout the morning so far. Um, mm -hmm. I often have clients who come from dysfunctional families say, I don't want to talk to my friends about my issues. I don't want to burden them or everyone else's issues are worse than mine. How do we help clients who minimize their needs 
ask for support. Mm. This is really interesting because it goes back to what I said about them having empathy for the people who harm them or even for other people. And they create this hierarchy of this person's problems is bigger than mine or this person's problem is smaller than mine. And it's a very interesting space for our clients to live in because it leaves no room for them to really exist. Mm. They're saying that um, even if I have the same problem as someone else, you know, insert my problem on someone else, it's going to be bigger for this other, other person. And it's actually not true. It's the way in which their brain has learned to deal with the things that they've experienced. It is a way to protect the people who have harmed them. It is a way to stay in some of these unhealthy relationships. And unfortunately, it is a way that they continue to not have any of their needs met. And so our job is to sort of highlight um, a problem is a problem. You know, um, I'm a parent and when my six-year-old has a problem, that is the biggest problem to my six-year-old, not being able to find a pencil sharpener. Is that equivalent to, you know, maybe running late for a meeting? No, they're both problems. And so it's not necessary to say, well, your problem is bigger because the problem is bigger to the person experiencing the problem is not really based on what's happening. Now, there are some things that are emergency. You may put your problem to the side, but very often that's not the case. You know, I, I think of putting our problem to the side is, you know, you're driving and you have to get somewhere by a certain time and here an ambulance is coming and they have a bigger crisis than you. So you need to pull over, wait a few minutes and then let them go by. Now that makes sense, but often our clients aren't doing that. They're usually same level problems or very similar issues that they are prioritizing for other people. So I would wonder, is that in some way um, a bit of codependency and how they're perceiving other people's problems and really helping this other person to have this bigger problem than they actually have? Like, you know, oh my gosh, this person has, I have to support them around this stuff. They are discouraging people from supporting them even by minimizing their problems. All of your problems are a big deal to you. Um, and that is a statement that I make to my clients. All of your problems are a big deal to you because what happens sometimes in, in therapy sessions is, you know, we'll, we'll start talking about anything. I once had a client start talking about her, she's in a cube, you know, in cube world and someone in another cubicle eat something really loud. And she was going on and on about this person sipping their soup. And it was so loud. And she's like, why am I talking about this? And I said, because it's a problem for you. It sounds like, you know, this doesn't fit the dynamics of what you want to hear at work. It's a problem for you, but it shouldn't be a problem, but it is a problem. Now, maybe the resolution is not, hey, stop eating. You can't tell anyone that but maybe you wear earplugs. Maybe when they start eating, that's a wonderful time for you to have your break and go to the break room. Maybe that's a wonderful time for you to um, step away and go to the bathroom when they start to eat. There's a lot of power and control in what you can do, but whatever you talk about is an issue to you. So I don't want you to feel like there are you know, these problems you can talk about, these problems you can't talk about, particularly in therapy. Our relationship with the client is not like the relationship they have with friends and family. So if you want to talk to me about how one nail is not growing at the same pace as the other nail, I will listen to it because I am your therapist. It is what I'm supposed to do. So let's work through this. So 
How do we help them understand that even our relationship with them is unique? And maybe some of these things that they're talking about with other people, the way the person is responding to it needs to be, you know, reshaped a bit. And so we have to teach our client how to have a little bit of control in the conversation with this other person you know what sort of things do you say when someone dismisses your problem what sort of things do you say when you know you feel like someone is having a problem and they haven't heard yours so those are some conversational boundaries that we can teach them to have with other people victoria let's let's do one more Sure. Um, what do you tell clients when they've been honest with their family about their unmet needs and were then outcast in some way? Mm. What do we tell clients? Huh? You know, people are entitled to a reaction and we may not always like their reaction. Also, we don't want to scare people away from honesty so it can be really challenging to um receive a consequence like that but there are times when people may not be ready to hear the truth and how do we allow our clients to share when they're comfortable doing so instead of when they feel like they have to do it because they're aware of this information should we be preparing them for potential consequences from other people i think so you know i i, I think it can be really helpful when they're i'm going to say this to the person okay so what sort of ways might they respond? Are you okay if they say this? Or are you okay if they do that? Because sometimes, you know, they don't anticipate that this can be a person's response. They can say, oh, wow, thank you for telling me. Or I want to distance myself from you because I don't even like what you're saying about me. So people have options just as we have the option to share. And so sharing can be very helpful, but it can also really backfire when people who don't, with people who may not be ready to change anything on their part or with people who um, may see you as the problem. So unfortunately, that can be a really big um, issue for some of our clients. I've had clients write their parents letters where they're like this is how i was impacted by these things and they give the client the, the the parent the letter and the parent has no response the parent you know calls and talks to them like everything is normal they don't even recognize that this happened which is crushing to the client because they you know they're crying and writing this letter and they've done all this work to uncover these things and the parent is like I'm not recognizing any of that. Did you want to go to dinner Sunday? They they don't want to respond to it. So unfortunately, you know, that can be a part of it. How do we help them deal with reactions from other people? You know, we provide a safe space for them. We let them know that, you know, you said something very brave and bold, and I'm so proud of you. And it sounds like this other person wasn't ready to hear it. It sounds like this other person didn't receive it in the way that you wanted them to. Is there any repairing that you want to do? What do you want to do now that this person is not able to receive it? How do we help them along um, despite the things that sort of happen with this? It strikes me that there's a way that some of these clients can enter an almost helpless state. Like, what's the point of speaking my truth if it's received in a way that is dismissive or outcasting? Yeah. Well, this next part will be helpful. And I might have time for more questions, but this next part I think will be really helpful. So um reasons clients may stay in unhealthy relationships we will spend a lot of time on this portion i'm actually going to open drama free and read from this so um there are a few reasons that you know we may see them not ready to relieve some 
to leave some relationships. Fear of isolation, that is what happened with the person who, who just mentioned um, said client. Another thing is they are content with the way things are. You know, when we are requesting that people change, you know, like sometimes you'll have therapists who are like, you know, you need to do this or, you know, or when we as, you know, maybe the client is requesting that this family member change. Some people are fine with the way that they are. Some people are fine with their level of dysfunction and maybe they just want to talk about it and complain. So sometimes we need to distinguish the difference between clients who want to do something about their situation and those who just want to complain about their situation. Because in the complaint doesn't mean that they're ready to change. It just means that they have an issue with this thing and they really, really want to talk about it. Um, they lack the tools to actually start. Some people don't even have the tools to begin to change anything. And so what we will see is them really being stuck in what's happening in their situation and not knowing how to start, to start having a really unhelpful conversation or a helpful conversation. Um, I mentioned earlier letter writing. So I have found that many people are comfortable writing a letter because it's all of your feelings, it's everything that you need to say, and you don't have to deal with the person's reaction necessarily. Also, you know, I've had people send an email or even send a text. And I wonder sometimes if it is it is good just for them to get it out without this other person freeing them for whatever this is. Is it good for you just to get out what your issue is with this person so the air is clear, they know exactly why this thing is happening? Um, could that be the beauty of a person even knowing whether they have this you know, positive response or not? Clients may choose to stay in unhealthy relationships because of their own mental health issues. They may be dependent on some of these dysfunctional family members. They may be dependent on um, the relationship going a certain way, or they may lack the tools to really get out of there because of some of their mental health challenges. I, um, I had a um, client a while ago where whenever they would have an episode, it would be triggered by their mother, who was verbally abusive, who was degrading, who in childhood didn't raise the person for many years of their life, was in and out. And so whenever they would have these mental health issues or become, um, you know, to the point they needed to be hospitalized, it was because of their interactions with this parent. It was really unfortunate, but it was it was something that the, the client really wanted from this parent. They really wanted, even though they couldn't get it, they really wanted a certain level of support. They really wanted a certain level of attention and, and affection. And so they would still try to get it, even knowing that they, they couldn't receive it, but the abuse would get to a point in the relationship where they would start to have you know, more fights and you know, all of these sort of things, which will cause the client to actually have more mental health issues, which was really, really unfortunate. Um, clients may choose to stay in unhealthy relationships because there are issues in um, other relationships. You know, when you choose to leave a relationship with a parent or even to change it, there may be um, some reaction from the other parent. If you have an issue with your father, your mother may have a response to you having an issue with your father. Your siblings may have an issue with you having an uh, issue with your parent. So sometimes people stay in unhealthy relationships because they simply don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to create this big thing with multiple people. So they end up you know, staying in these relationships as a way of preserving 
all of these other relationships in the family. It can be very unfortunate when a person um, chooses to, to leave a relationship and then it impacts all the other relationships. So in those cases, people may choose to stay. I wonder in your practices, what are some reasons um, or, or what are some, some things you've seen as why clients stay in unhealthy relationships? I'll just give you a few minutes to sort of think about that. I want to read a bit from Drama Free, and if you all have the book, this is on page 10, and it is reasons we don't talk about family problems. Reason number one, and there are one, two, three, four, five. Number one, thinking that family issues are a reflection of who we are. So often we'll have clients not mention some of their family issues because they want us, the therapist, to perceive them in a certain way. We do have clients who care so much about what we think, what we feel, what we see in them, um, because they have some relationship with us and they want us to be persuaded in a positive way by who they are. And so if they share some of these things about their family, they may see that as you're going to think this about me. Um, a really helpful way to help our clients with that is to have them maybe write a list of what do you think people think about you? What do you think people think about your family? And to see if there's any overlap there and really talk them through some of that overlap because it could be that what they're thinking that people see is not actually what they see. And we have a unique view as to what we see in them because sometimes they are modeling with us who they are in the world. Um, you know, for our clients who um, show up late all the time, I'm always like, oh, you're late to all your meetings. You know, for our clients who, um, dress so well, you know, that's how they dress in the world for our clients who are like, what do you think? What do you, you know, like that's how they are with other people. So we do have some ability to see who they are in the world, even if we're not in that space with them. Um, so really helping them to see what is the difference between you and your family? Because if you think those things are the same, what is your power to change those things? People don't talk about, you know, some of these family problems because they're embarrassed or ashamed. And one of the most helpful ways to help them combat that is to help them talk about these things, to talk about these things with you and not just the bad things. You know, I want to hear about your mom's peach cobbler. I want to hear about your grandmother's pound cake. 
Tell me all the stuff, not just the bad stuff, but let's talk about the stuff. So when the big stuff comes up, you're not like, I don't have any positive information. So let's talk about who people are. And we really have to help them see that I don't think people are all bad. I think that, you know, your mother had some wonderful qualities and here are some things she did because we have to humanize your mom's story. We're humanizing your story. I'm trying to understand everyone. It's not a matter of me just trying to understand you as much as it is this collective opportunity to understand everyone. And just because a person did something, it doesn't mean you're a terrible person. So you telling me this stuff doesn't mean that I think your mom is horrible or your sister is horrible. It means that I'm getting one side of it. And from what you're saying, this is what I see. Um, people don't talk about family problems because they're really trying to ignore the issues. The more they talk about the issues, the more they feel this desire to address the issues, the more they feel the urge to work through some of those problems. So it can be very, you know, hopeful, unfortunately, for them to not talk about the issues because it keeps them in the unhealthy relationships. Another reason they may not be ready to address these um, family problems is they don't think anyone will understand so many of our clients have kept secrets that they don't understand that other people are like them. A really good tool for this is for you to have a repertoire of just books around trauma that share stories of people who have experienced similar things. Even some TV shows, you know, just have some reference point for clients to go to and say, well, you know, I read this book called The Glass Castle and this girl you know, she grew up with her parents and they had mental health issues and she talks about how they impacted her. I wonder if this would be a book that, you know, maybe you could see yourself in. So even giving them a resource where they can say, oh my gosh, like when I read that, or sometimes um, it can be really helpful to have them share, you know, what is your favorite book? And then they may say, you know, oh, my favorite book is this. Why do you identify with the character? Does this person connect to you in any way to get them to, to talk about some of those challenges or to get them to, you know, relate their story to a TV show? So sometimes getting them to step outside of that stuff can be, you know, very helpful. I have my Oprah mug today. And so sometimes I will even use Oprah because her, st her story is so public, you know, oh, mother issues. Have you ever heard the story about Oprah saying, you know, and I'll go into a whole thing of some, you know, story you could Google and, and we'll talk about it to help them understand that you are not the only one. There are other people. Sometimes it's fictional, but most fiction is based on truth or something that has happened. Um, there are people you may know. There are things that, you know, um, people haven't shared with you yet but the vulnerability will build community for you just being open about some of these things you will find your people you will find some things that are really helpful for you and lastly people may not talk about some of these family issues because they fear being judged they don't want people to say oh my gosh i i can't believe that happened to you you must be this you know um I think, unfortunately, people are labeled a certain way because of their family circumstances, and it doesn't have to be anything that they did or anything that they, you know, may have went through. I think about that sometimes where, you know, like the Dahmer family, like, you know, the, the judgment if you're a Dahmer, and I, and I have read somewhere that I don't know if you all watched the Jeffrey Dahmer series, but I think his brother changed his name because of that stigma. So sometimes because of what has happened in our family, what people have done, there is some stigma around that. And so people may not share or even talk about what some of those things are. Victoria, I'd love to answer maybe two more questions, two to three. Sure, Nedra. 
Okay, there I am. Um, I just did have some people sharing with you reasons from their perspective why clients may choose to stay in unhealthy relationships. So I'll just list some of those off so that you can hear how engaged folks are today. Um, many clients have trouble leaving unhealthy relationships because of the children and feeling that leaving a relationship will disconnect them from their grandchildren eventually, or if they're in a marriage from their own children. Um, uh, stay out of guilt, reluctance to leave a partner that is struggling. They might stay for religious reasons, um, fear of the unknown, selective attention. Like they hold on to the person's good traits and ignore or forget about all the negative ones, um, financial reasons. Um, and, and just kind of, it's, it's very frightening to move out of the box, uh, that, that these unhealthy relationships are their norm and their worldview. Um, what are, what are best practices to help people overcome, um, some of these fears about making a change? Mm. I hear that about the, the other relationships that, you know, it'll impact the grandkids, it'll impact this. And so, you know, I've heard, I was, I was recently speaking with someone who, has a very problematic relationship with their sister, but they stay in the relationship because of their niece and nephew and the relationship they have with the niece and nephew. Because if they end the relationship with the sister, the way that um, you know this, this person believes it will go, the sister will say, well, you can't talk to my kids anymore. And so, you know, the aunt feels as if, well, I have to stay in this relationship at least until the kids are 18 you know and they can talk to me on their own because even though their mother is like you know doing all of these unhealthy things i can't i really want a relationship with them and so that is you know a really unfortunate piece of it but i don't want us to focus so much on leaving relationships as much as we'll focus more after um my talk with dr call carl on boundaries because it's not always about a person leaving a relationship. Most of the time, it's about developing some healthier practices with yourself in the relationship. So you want to make sure that you are protected. And this person can do whatever. They can gossip. They can do all this stuff. And it's like, well, they don't have anything to say to, about me because I don't tell them anything. So now they're making up stuff. And it's, you know, again, something you can't control, but you're able to preserve the relationships that you care about. So how do you deal with people who are not ready to change? Because that's a lot of the work that we do with clients. It's not about leaving these relationships. It's about changing the way that you show up with people who have certain qualities. So you don't have to leave a relationship and impact these other relationships, but you may have to speak up for yourself a little bit more, or you may have to have some boundaries or spend less time with the person or do all of these other things outside of um, ending a relationship because that might not be possible for the situation. Selective attention, yes, you know, people do focus very heavily on the positive things about a person. They can, you know, it goes back to that empathy piece. Like this person, you know, they struggle to do this or, you know, they're really amazing at this and they're unhealthy in these very detrimental ways and they may not leave the relationship. I do wonder as we're talking about this, um, you know, I, I think sometimes as a therapist, I've had some clients where I'm like, the sister again, knew he was going to do that. Your dad, you know, you, you get so uh, personally mm -hmm. attached to the person and their outcome and wanting them to feel better and not experience these people in the same way that we feel like the only solution is leave this relationship. Mm -hmm. there are so many other solutions that maybe the client isn't sharing. One thing that I've started to, to ask my clients, because sometimes they'll be a little dishonest and they'll say, they'll be talking about like what they thought, but they haven't said this to the other person. Mm. So 
I was so mad and they did this. Did you tell them? No. Hmm. I wonder if that was an opportunity for them to see how much this impacts you. So sometimes even letting them know, like, you don't have just take this anger back to them. It's not even, you know, you have to, and I'm angry, I got to leave the relationship, but just I'm angry. So sometimes sharing a feeling, it's not the other person doing anything. It's just saying, I'm mad at you. In a healthy relationship, if we want to bring these relationships to healthier, people can be mad at you. People can be upset. They don't have to be this uh, pleased with everything that you do. So how do we move our clients towards just expressing feelings without having to do anything, just saying the feeling. That is the work. The work is just saying, this is how this made me feel. And maybe there's nothing you can do about it. I just wanted you to know that this bothers me. Um, and then there was another one, like thinking this is the norm, which is really unfortunate. Um, some people really do believe that chaos is comfort and they really believe that you know all relationships are hard and you have to fight and you have to struggle and it just it, it seems like they're fighting for civil rights in a relationship though it's like it's not that hard you're just trying to exist and if you have to do all of those things to exist perhaps there is an issue Perhaps the issue is, you know, the other person, maybe it's your approach, maybe it's you two combined, maybe it is a pattern of, of things in the relationship, but relationships are actually not that hard. You know how you, and even, you know, explaining to them the other re healthy relationships, remember how you met your girlfriend and you know, you just met and everything was easy and you got along. That's how a family relationship can be. You know, how you just walk outside and you say hi to your neighbor and nobody calls each other a name. That's how a family relationship could be. Like these things exist. It's not um, that this is how it has to be. It's that this is how it is based on your family situation. But this is, it can be the norm in the family and still in society, very unhealthy and not normal. Do you have another one, Victoria? Sure, yeah. Um, you, you shared earlier about how sometimes clients don't give us the full story um, until they're ready to share things. Mm -hmm. Are there um, suggestions you would make for those clinicians who are working in a short-term treatment setting where there might be boundary issues or relationship issues kind of beneath the surface, but there may not be a lot of time for that to organically come up? When you are working in a time-limited space, I think that's why you, where you have to be a bit more fast-paced and you have to load your clients with activities and assignments and you know really follow up with them to make sure they're they're actually doing some of this stuff when it is a you know maybe a private treatment setting and the client can come for 20 years if they want to you have time to get to it but there are some environments where it's like I get six weeks with this person I get eight weeks with this person and that's where we have to be activity heavy to help them uncover some of this stuff um, one workbook for um, people with family issues that I think is really helpful is Repeat After Me by Dr. Claudia Brown. And she just goes through so many different family issues and how to address them. When I give my clients those sort of homework assignments and they don't complete them, my question is, where did you get stuck? because that's the thing that you weren't ready to talk about. And that might bring about the conversation of what's really going on with someone. Um, there are some other workbooks I will think about them as we're talking, maybe on break, and I'll, I'll give you a list. But I think that's where we get kind of activity focused. And, you know, if you're using a book like Set Boundaries, Find Peace or Drama Free, you just pull out those questions. I'm, I'm looking at the end of, you know, um, chapter one, and it's like, what dysfunctional family patterns have you carried into your adult relationships? 
That's your homework assignment. Please answer that question for me. Come back with, you know, three things. Or have you ever felt powerless in your ability to make changes within your family? Because you may be hearing it. As a therapist, you may be hearing that this person doesn't feel like they can do it. So getting them to admit it through this question could be really helpful. Or whom do you feel comfortable talking to about your upbringing? And why are you comfortable talking to that person? You know, so even using like a, you know, a resource such as a book, if you're reading a book and just developing your own questions to kind of pull out some of those things that they may not share. Also, assessment is really important um, when you're in a short term setting. And I know many of us, we may have a assessment tool that we have to use, but there have been times where I kind of come up with my own thing because I tend to be a little more relationship focused. And in some psychological settings, it might be more on, on you know, psychological history, medication, and all of these things. And I'm like, what's your birth order? What is <laughs> like, who is your first best friend? <laughs> like I I want to know a whole different set of things because I'm trying to understand how you operate in relationships. So don't be afraid to use your creativity in developing some assessment questions that you in particular need to know for the things that you want to address with your client who is having this issue. And don't be afraid to revisit, you know, some assessment questions. It might be the third session you say, you know, the first session I asked you this set of questions and those were great, but I, I have about five questions that I need to ask so I'll know how we should proceed. And you can, you know, you can bring it up then and just have, you know, um, whatever those questions are. But sometimes it's really helpful to, to sort of start with some of the common things that you're seeing, like, you know, trauma. I remember trauma wasn't even you know, I've been doing this for 15 years. And I remember a time where trauma wasn't necessarily a consideration on a psychosocial evaluation. It was, it wasn't. And so I would add my own thing, like, have you ever been in a car accident? Have, you know, you ever, ever left a relationship abruptly or has someone ever left you abruptly? Have you experienced death? Like all the things that I could think of where a person might have a response because they're, they may not say this, but it's really important to know like, that's why they have this thing. That's why they, okay, now I know they have, okay. So, because they may never say it because sometimes they aren't thinking about the thing that's the, the, uh, the reason for their problem. They're only thinking about the thing that's impacting them right now. Like I'm at work and I'm burnt out. Like that's all they want to talk about. Oh my gosh, I have this many projects. Oh my gosh, this coworker. Oh, all of this stuff, but it's like, huh, wh wh why are you the sort of person who feels the need to constantly be productive? So if you have a lot of burnout clients, it might be helpful to know, like, you know, were you an only child? Were you raised by a single parent? Are you the oldest? Like, what things makes a person want to, to be highly productive? You know, so sort of thinking about that and just adding it to an assessment can be really helpful for the population that you work with um, on a regular basis. There could be clues to the client's relationship style in the therapy relationship too, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. And I mentioned that earlier that our clients are, you know, representing who they are even with us. You mm -hmm. know, sometimes you'll have clients who are a bit passive. They'll have an issue with you and they won't say anything or you know, I've had clients, I, my office is so hot. I have on a space heater and I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's probably going to be 80 degrees today. Um, it's sometimes 90 and 100 and I have on a space heater. It's really hot. But this is what I say to my clients on my first session. I tend to run very cold. If you ever have an issue with the temperature in here, let me know. Once in a while, I'll have a client let me know and I turn it off before they come and I kick the ear up and I suffer through the session. And then, you know, I found that some clients, it'll be years later. And they're like, yeah, your office is so hot. I don't wear, like, I told you to tell me. <laughs> so this, this is how they are in relationships. Mm -hmm. 
that they keep these things to themselves and they're really bothered by it. And it takes two years for them to say, oh, I can't help you with this thing, or this is my problem, or this is no, or whatever it is. It takes them that long to express their issues. And then you'll have other people who say, actually, it is a little more. Mm -hmm. So it's not a test, but it sort of is a little test for me. <laughs> But, you know, I, I think we have to think about how people are with us and see that as, you know, how they may be in other relationships. You know, um, if a person is concerned about what we think about them, like you probably think I'm crazy. They probably think that about a lot of people when they say stuff. Mm -hmm. It's not just you. They, they're, they're always probably thinking that about people. Oh my gosh, they're going to think I'm so crazy. And so what do I do with that information? You know, I think it's so interesting that you think that about me. And I think it's so normal what you're talking about. Maybe it's my line of work. Um, but I think what you're saying is very normal. And I also wonder, why do you think that I would think that about you? What do you think about what you said? Uh, what do you think is, is so wild that, that a person would think, oh my gosh, this person is crazy they just said that. What, what, what was it? You know, so sometimes it is, it is just a sign to them some of the stuff that we see them doing. Um, when we notice, you know, some of their nervous tics, they're moving their legs and all of these things, you know, asking them, Am I, am I making you uncomfortable with the topic we're talking about? Because this is how they express their discomfort. Yes, okay. They're not going to say it, but okay. So when you're uncomfortable, you start having a physical reaction, but you don't tell people. No. So we can see, we have, you know, a little bit of a window. Sometimes I, I do wish I have the superpower of like being a fly on the wall in my clients' lives to see what they're really doing. Um, kind of like, I don't know if you all have started watching that show, Shrinking, um, but he has started to, it's a show on Apple TV, but this therapist has started to like show up randomly in his clients' lives, like on their date where they're like, oh, I'm dating all these people and they're so weird. And he shows up and he's like, I knew it was you. You're the weird one, you know, so, you know, we can't do that, but we have a little bit of a window to really understand who people are and how they're showing up, you know, in these relationships in the world. Yeah. And to give clients a model of how a relationship can be, you can be honest in a relationship. You can have a dialogue with the person and yeah. Thank you, Nedra. You're welcome. Um, I understand that there probably are a lot of questions. We do have, you know, a few breaks, um, one after, uh, right before lunch, we'll have another break for a Q&A. It'll be 20 minutes, so more questions there. And then we'll have one this afternoon for about 15 minutes. I do find it helpful just throughout to have a few questions because I understand there are quite a few folks here and I don't want them to pile up. And I realize that I'm saying a lot of things. So I want to make sure that, you know, people have the opportunity to process. The questions so far have been very helpful in helping me think about um, some of this material. So um, Dr. Carl, Carl Palamore, author of Fault Lines, Fractured Families and How to Mend Them, has identified six top reasons for estrangement. Before we get into this, we will talk to Dr. Carl this afternoon, but before we get into this, I do want to go down the path of talking about estrangement being one option. It is the option that I have seen mentioned the most on social media, um, the, the no contact, the um, uninvolvement with people, just all of these, you know, new wording around becoming estranged. And it is an option. I will say that most of our clients will not choose the option of estrangement. Most of our clients will choose the option of staying as things are. We will have some clients who choose estrangement, but many of them 
will not be ready to leave the relationship. But it's so important for us to know how to handle our clients once they decide to leave these relationships. Um, I want to read a little bit here just about estrangement. So estrangement is severing ties with one or more family members. And it's more common than we care to acknowledge. Sometimes the estrangement is intended to be short-term, used as a pause, or it may be long-term with no plans to reconcile. Two types of estrangements can occur, intentional emotional detachment and physical estrangement with the termination of all contact. I want to pause there. Um, emotional detachment. This is the one that we'll see most often, where people are living a life that perhaps their families are unaware of. They have um, limited emotional contact with them, so they may just talk to them on the holidays, or they talk to them about all of these other things and not really themselves, or maybe they engage in some, some gossiping with the family, but again, not necessarily about themselves. So we may see more emotional estrangements than we do physical estrangements. And it's likely that that emotional estrangement will come before the actual physical estrangement. Physical estrangement is where they sever all ties. There is no calling, talking to, or anyone else. As we've mentioned, this very likely impacts other family relationships. So when a person decides to um, leave the relationship with one parent, the other parent may go with them as well. Um, when a person decides not to talk to a sibling, there may be a family member who is constantly coaxing them to be in relationship with that family member. So there are all sorts of ways that people are encouraged sometimes to stay in, in those family relationships. So here are some things that um, I think could be helpful for our clients to say if they are in estranged um, relationships with someone and we have you know, maybe a family member who is trying to get in there and say, you should talk to this other person. Um, it could be helpful for them to say something like, you know, I understand that this is not what you want, but this is a choice that I feel I had to make based on what was happening. It could also be helpful for them to say, um, I appreciate, you know, your, your honesty about how you feel about this. And also, I have my own feelings about this. It would also be helpful for them to say, please don't try to persuade me to be back in a relationship that was really harmful for me and I decided to leave. So sometimes we are helping them shape their response to even being estranged because other family members may have a reaction to that. And it's very likely that they do because it is, um, you know, shame on the family. Family rifts can be shameful or embarrassing. And so many people want to control the narrative. So if you have, you know, two children who don't speak, or if you're not speaking to your parent and the other parent has to deal with that, it is a symbol of some sort of family dysfunction. And it's often something you can't hide because people can see it. Why isn't so-and-so here? Well, did you invite so-and-so? And so for families, it can be very uncomfortable for them to have those sort of conversations or even confront that with other people. And so very often it makes sense, even though it's not healthy for you, but it can make sense for them to try to pull you back into the other, the other, uh, it can make sense for them to try to pull the client back into that unhealthy relationship. And so we almost have to prepare them to anticipate that there may be some instances where family members are trying to pull them back into these unhealthy dynamics. Now, let's take a look at this list. Um, top six reasons for estrangements. Issues in the relationship since childhood. 
with siblings, um, you may see this and it can look like, you know, um, she's always been the favorite or my father favors, you know, this person over that person or when we were eight, this person didn't do this or, you know, we never really got along all of these sorts of things um, with siblings and then with, you know, parent child. Again, it can be those longstanding things. You've never listened to me before. Um, you've always picked so-and-so's side or your addiction impacted me in the following way. When I was a kid, this is the issue that I dealt with and you didn't help me with it or you weren't there for me in this way. So the problem could have existed for many, many years. And it has gotten to a point where the person is ready to leave the relationship. Divorce. Um, so sometimes with divorce, there is, you know, resentment, animosity, and people pick sides. It is an unfortunate part of divorce. Sometimes this is encouraged by one parent or the other, where the parent may directly say, me or your dad or um, indirectly um, do things to make a child feel as if they have to choose. And so that child will become estranged from the other parent. Um, and then sometimes, you know, adults do things, whether it is cheating, whether it is leaving it in a certain way, that it is impactful for the child. And again, the other person may hold them accountable. You know, um, the relationship is over because your mom cheated. Um, or you or the not you, but the client may see it as, you know, my my parents are no longer married because my dad, my dad did X, Y and Z. So all of those things sort of impact whether or not people want to stay in the relationship. A really big one that we see around death is fights over money, um, which is loans and, you know, sometimes inheritances, mostly inheritances when it's when it's death and then just within the family loans. Um, unfortunately, not everyone um, has everything laid out. And even when they do, it is still issues because a, a will is a wonderful thing, but it essentially states, this is how I want my money allocated. And every person may not agree on that. People may feel, well, if you had three kids, it should be split you know, in three parts when the parent may say, well, I think this person deserves more, you deserve nothing. And, you know, it creates these really big family issues, which can sometimes be unfortunate and ultimately lead to estrangement. The interesting thing um, that I've seen impact people is when it's a fight over money, and there may be other family members involved, everyone has a different view of it. So you'll have all of these, like this person talks to that person and that person talks to this person and this person doesn't talk. It's, it's a big old mess sometimes, but there is certainly a higher level of estrangement with um, fights over money. Um, unmet needs and, and repeated failure to adhere to boundaries. You know, people get tired at some point of repeating a boundary. I think repeating is a very helpful thing, but how often do we have to say to people, this is what I want, this is what I want, this is what I want. At some, at some point, people may get upset that the person won't listen. They are upset that the person cannot adhere to the thing that they're requesting. And so they may just say, you know, I don't want the relationship anymore. It takes too much emotional work to try to get this person to um, adhere to these, these rules that I have. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to be um, these, these big things. It can sometimes be, you know, a, a, our clients trying to raise their kids in a certain way and their, their families trying to do their, their own thing and, you know, really pick at how they parent or pick at how they do certain things that might cause them to have some sort of estrangement. So there are all sorts of reasons why a person might choose to move away from family relationships when there are repeated boundary violations. Um, differences in beliefs, lifestyles, and values. I am in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I will say for the LGBTQ population that there is a lot of estrangement around 
um, being openly LGBTQ plus. Um, it is unfortunate, but it's also um, typically initiated by the parent and not the child. So I usually see the client who is dealing with being estranged from their parent because they have said, I am gay, I am lesbian, or if not a strength, then they are um, treated in some unfavorable way. Your partner can't come visit, you can't do this, we don't wanna see it. All of these um, very unfortunate things that the parent will say really conflicts with their values, their belief. Um, it's typically religiously based. And so in those situations, a lot of the work is helping um, the client who has been honest, which is a wonderful thing, because as we know, living um, in a way that is not authentic, is, um, is it causes its own issues. It, we have higher likelihood of depression and suicidal ideation and all of these things. So them being honest with their families is a really positive thing. And unfortunately, there may be some reaction that is also unhealthy. So how do we um, help them deal with, you know, this level of estrangement and isolation based on them living in their truth? And often, you know, the way that we help them deal with that is to help them build chosen family, to help them seek out um, mentorships and friendships and um, relationships where they can connect deeper and maybe move away from some of those unhealthy family relationships where people refuse to accept them. And the last um, reason that we might see a higher level of estrangement is ongoing challenges with in-laws. <laughs> I wrote drama free, um, but I really could have wrote all of the drama with your mother-in-law because I get so many questions on Instagram, questions from clients about in-laws. Father-in-laws are apparently doing an amazing job, mostly, um, but it's something with the mother-in-laws and sometimes the sister-in-laws that are presenting these ongoing challenges. And I, I really think it goes back to you know, the fifth one, whereas those beliefs, the lifestyles and the values that people have a certain way that they feel their family, even when their child is, you know, creating their own life, their family should be. And so when that is the case, there are these, you know, these conflicts around like, you should be doing this in your house. I should be able to do this with your family. This is how we do things. And so you know, there are some folks who get to a point where it is no longer a relationship that um, they choose to be in because there is so much conflict. I will say that these are the top six reasons, but if I had to, you know, highlight the, the top reasons that people become estranged, it is really, they get tired. You know, I think with, that's not very clinical, but they get tired of these unhealthy relationships and a relationship not improving or the other person not improving and having to do so much work to be in a relationship. We don't typically see estrangements with people who had childhood issues, but now the parent recognizes these issues and is trying to make some sort of um, progress in a relationship. Every once in a while, that person might choose to leave it, but it's really when, you know, there were childhood issues and there's still issues to the same capacity in adulthood. Um, so that is, you know, one thing that I see that people get, you know, really tired or they are just really hurt. They're heartbroken. They are very sad that these relationships aren't being improved. For the divorce option, you know, I think this is one of the more unfortunate reasons that people become estranged because it is, you know, it's really when it's children in particular, I, I get a little sad, you know, seeing um, adults not protect or preserve that relationship in favor of, you know, the adult 
contention. And so it can be really hard. And I also believe that that is a point where we notice our sore spots that we really have to lean on our, um, our own therapy or, you know, our own support groups to help us with that. Because some things that we see, we may not always agree with that therapist. And it's really important that we take time to manage the things that we don't agree with. Um, we may not agree with estrangement. We may not support it, or we may not support it for the particular reason that a person wants to leave a relationship. So it's really important that we work through our stuff so we're not putting it on the client to stay in a relationship that they're ready to leave. It's 1145 Eastern. Um, we have about a 15 minute break and then we will be back with Dr. Carl. So enjoy your break.